One more time. Let's ask the Lord. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus who became the word and became flesh. We thank you for everything. We ask you that you just touch our hearts tonight as we look at your word. Give us understanding. May we just get imparted into us what you want to, us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, we're looking at Psalm number 42 and 43. Everybody got a copy that they need? There's some available to read it. First thing I want to mention about these two Psalms is that in many of the Hebrew manuscripts, they are one. They are together in one Psalm. The reason for that is that they, they really in, are with each other, they intervene with each other. In other words, if you take this Psalm 42 and not 43, you don't have the total picture. So this, this is, whether it's one Psalm or two Psalms doesn't make any difference. The point is they need each other and they, they need each other to explain it. Also, I want to point out to you, if you look at the psalm, if it's, who, who did the psalm? What does this say? Who, who did the psalm? The sons of Korah. It might be helpful to understand a little bit about the history of this. Korah was one of those who was a very influential man and remember that Moses was picked by God to lead the people from Egypt to the promised land. Moses didn't want to do that. Right. You, you read the scripture and you see he, he was sure that uh, God should pick somebody else. But you know pretty tough when you argue with God, you don't often uh, win. And so Moses didn't win, so he became the leader. Not that he wanted to be, but he was. Well, and in, the, in that trip from, trip from uh, Egypt to the Promised Land, there was a lot of bickering and people were dissatisfied. They didn't like the food they were eating, they didn't like the water they were eating, but it all boiled down to a real crisis experience in the book of Numbers chapter 16. Because one of the leaders by the name of Korah decided he was going to start a rebellion against Moses. And so he presented to Moses the thought that we should all be in leadership. Who chose you? I mean, what, what gives you the right to be in leadership over us? We're all holy people. And, of course, this cut to the quick for Moses, but he said, tomorrow we will find out what God wants. So, in other words, the next day then, they all gathered, and uh, God had them separated between Moses and those who were following him and Korah, those who were following him. And so, all of a sudden, in the midst of this turmoil, and God split the earth open. And all of the men that were arguing against Moses, Korah, and his family, they all fell into the, to the grave in the crack in the, in the ground. A lot of People came under that, fell into the crack. But I say all of that, there was an exception. The exception was the sons of Korah. They never joined with their father. They thought the, his rebellion, his mutiny was absurd. They joined with Moses so that they, the sons of Korah, were not the ones that fell into the ground like the rest of the families did. Now it's later on, and we see those sons 
have become leaders in the tabernacle and later in the temple. They began to lead the singing worship. And what's interesting though, is there's about 12 of the Psalms that are written by the sons of Korah. None of them have the name of the son. All of them are simply sons of Korah. It's thought that they did that because they wanted to make sure that they saw, they presented the family that had resisted the mutiny, that they presented them as a unison before God and before the people. So whoever wrote the psalm, which one of the sons, takes a step backward into the family and allows the family and his brothers to all come forward so he just doesn't take the credit for himself. So these are written by the sons of Korah. Now, in this particular case, whichever son wrote this, he was in a, in a bad place from the standpoint of spirituality. He had been taken away from Jerusalem where the tabernacle was. He was taken up north against his will. We don't know why, but he was taken all up north against his will. And whatever caused him to be taken there doesn't, does not let him come home. And he longs for the time when he can come back to worship God at the tabernacle. You have to remember that for them, God was at the tabernacle. That's where he spoke to people, and that's where people spoke to him. So they wanted to do their best to get, he wanted to do his best to get back, but he couldn't. He found himself in a very difficult place. So he starts out with this song. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Now the illustration here is a deer that is being chased and longs for satisfying his thirst by finding a stream of water. The psalmist then picks up that thought of this deer who has reached a point where he's just panting for water, that he, that the psalmist says, as the deer pants for the water, so I pant for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Notice it's the living God. Nothing else will satisfy him, okay? It's not anything else, that a picture, anything else. He looks, he's thirsts for the God who is alive and the God who gives life to those who serve him. So, um, he says, when can I go and meet with God? Not where, he knows where. But it's a question of when. When is he going to be able to get out of this dilemma? Um, let me ask you a question. First of all, have any of you, in order to become believers in Christ, had resistance from the family? Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, from where I came from and who I was, at first it was disbelief, like I was trying to fake it. Um, yeah, and then uh, they just didn't want to believe, and now it's to a point where I'm the one that's called when they need prayer. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, can you say grace at Thanksgiving now? Yeah, yeah. You know, versus the ritualistic, rhyming, you know, yeah. prayer we've said for 30, 40 years. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure a number of you have had instances when family looked at you like you'd lost your, you know, your, your buttons. They still do. There's something wrong with you. But let me tell you something in my own life. I was fortunately raised in a Christian home and taken to a godly church that taught even as a child what it meant to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, which I did. And through my 
even in my teenage years, I had a number of wonderful experiences with God, many of them at the camp meetings that we would go to. Um, Big Prairie? It was, pardon me? Big Prairie? You went to Big Prairie? Yeah, Big Prairie camp meeting in those days. So I had many experiences, and and I, I that, that was my experience with God in many times in, in my teenage years. But sometimes when you get older, um, life gets in the way. And uh, what happened was that I'm now older. I have two children, two little daughters, married to two daughters. And uh, I'm very religious. I go to church every Sunday. I sing in the choir. I even teach a young boys Sunday school class. But something was missing. I knew that for me, it had become too much ritual and not enough with the personal experience with the Lord. Amen, right? And I got to the point where David cries out, God, my soul pants for you. I, I, it happened one Saturday night. My, uh, my normal routine was I prepared for Sunday to teach. Well, that was all done. And Saturday night, I'd turn on the TV and see what movie was on or something. And this Saturday night, Mary Ann was gone with the two, two girls to a mother-daughter banquet at the church. So I went over and turned, off, turned on the TV. And something inside of me said, turn the TV off and pray. I did. I went over and I knelt down beside the couch in our family room and started to cry out to God. God, I thirst for you. I'm not satisfied doing things. I need you, your presence. I thirst for you. It's, it's got to change. And that night changed my life. It doesn't mean that at times you don't have to always face that same reality because you get caught up in doing things in the church and uh, you think that's what it is. But you, could, I had to come to a point where, again, God was personal to me. The relationship is what counted. And uh, that's, that's where it was on that Saturday night. He goes on to say, my tears have been my food day and night. While men say to me all day long, where is your God? You know, when, you, when you're living in a culture that is not the, of God, there's always those who are going to say, um, well, you talked about God, you bragged on him, you bragged on his love, you bragged on his power. Where is he now when you need him? There's always those who are going to be questioning, where's God when you need him now? And they don't understand because they don't have that experience with God. Have you ever had an experience where you really thirsted for God? Every day. It, in, in life, have you thirsted for things? I mean, it, you know, we all thirst for things, okay? Um, we can go and wish we had something that we can't have. You had that? Maybe it was too costly, whatever. You couldn't have what you, did, what you wanted. But when we're talking spiritually like this, when we're talking about the things of God, um, we need to thirst for God more than we would thirst for other things in the world. And that's the key to our experience with the Lord is thirsting for him. And he says, when can I go and meet with God? <clears throat> he knows where, it's just not when. And he goes on, my tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God in all of this? <clears throat> These things I remember. Now, here he's going to go back into his memory bank. 
Now, no, he's away from Jerusalem. He's away from the tabernacle. So what does he have to rely on? He has to rely on his memory, things he used to do. These things I remember, he says. As I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the fast, festive throng. You know, there's a lot of times that um, when we find ourselves feeling that God is a long way off from us. You ever have that time where you feel, that even though it's, I'm not talking about distance, I'm talking about just within us, we just, seems as if God is a long way off and somehow he's not close to me or I'm not close to him. So, he goes to his memory bank and he begins to remember how it used to be. Some good things. He used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy among the fists, festive. But you know what? As good as memory of remembrance of things in the past can be, it's not enough. It's not enough. So he says to his Self, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now, this, this word soul here is used a number of different ways in the Bible. There are times when the word soul can be used just to the whole person. Okay? There are other times when the word soul is used... Um, to, to mean just the whole inner part of us, including the heart or including our spirit. But there's other times when the word soul is used to differ, differentiate from the, the soul and the spirit. And the soul is then related to humanity, whereas the spirit is always related to God. The humanity of the soul is, you know, what the soul, what your, when your mind and your thinking and your emotions, that's the part of the soul. But when you're talking about the spirit, you're talking about that which relates to God, to his ex to experiences with him and for his goodness and everything. And here, the... Psalmist finds himself in a debate. The debate is between his soul and his spirit. His soul is downcast, disturbed within him. But the spirit says, put your hope in God, and I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now, there's always for us a tendency for that debate between the soul and the spirit. There's always tendencies that want the human side of us, the this, this soulish part of us, the part that relates to humanity, to take control. But if you're a believer in Christ, you recognize that the spirit has to take over, for, for, over the soul. In other words, the spirit has to win. And in this case, when you're looking at this, you see the spirit is winning at this point. It's saying to the soulish part, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now, those are great words. Huh? Wonderful words, but it's not enough. He knows the answer, but he's still lacking something. So, look at the next verse. Here he talks about the reality. 
He's just finished saying, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, my God. But look at the next verse. My soul is downcast within me. In other words, he comes back to the reality that he's still in this situation and he's still struggling. Therefore, I will remember you. Now here's the key. In the first place, he remembered his past experiences, okay? Serving the Lord, how great that was. But now he recognizes that's not enough just to the past. Now he says, I remember you. And in the midst of all of that, he says, I remember you from actually no matter where I am, from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from the mountain, Mizar, deep calls to deep in the roar of the waterfalls and your waves and breakers, breakers have swept over me. The point is he's using the experience of where he is that there's a, obviously a waterfall and he's using the tumult of that waterfall that keeps keep splashing down and deep, deep calls to deep. He uses that to, to really see his own tumult of his own soul. Okay? So it's, uh, he's using it. But remember now, he says, I will remember you. In the midst of all of this that's going on, in the midst of all, even though I'm in this tumult, I, I, my soul is still disturbed. He says, by day, the Lord directs his life. Remember now, he's talking about, I remember you. And now he says, by day, the Lord directs his love. No matter where he is, he's saying, if I remember you, you direct your love throughout the day. Do you ever reach a point where you can't, can get away from God's love? Yeah. Never. Yeah. What does the scripture say to us? I will not leave you or forsake you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Pardon me? I will not leave you or forsake you. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 8? Nothing in all creation will separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ. Say it out loud. Nothing in all creation. Separate us from the love of God that is found yeah. in Christ. Yeah. Nothing can separate us from God's love. In trouble, hardship, persecution, nothing separates us from God's love. You're here tonight. Be assured that God loves you, and nothing can separate you from His love. Amen. No matter what it is that comes your way, no matter how you are disturbed by the soulish part of you, which at times we have to deal with, nothing causes God's love to, to not be a part of your life. He loves you if you've done a good thing. He loves you if you've done a bad thing. Right. I mean, the point is that his love is there, and that's eternal. Okay. By day he directs his love, at night his song is with me a prayer to the God of my life. In other words, at nighttime he sings a prayer to the Lord. Um, I wonder, is there a, a place or a time or is there a song, a chorus, that at the nighttime goes through you that you sing to the Lord as a matter of prayer. Ever do that? You sing to the Lord at night? I'm talking about you're, in your, you're reclining in your bed, and I'm not talking about a loud voice, but you sing a prayer to the Lord. And that's what the uh, psalmist is saying. By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Now, remember, this is the living God. He talked about in verse number two. 
living God is the one who is alive and who brings life. And now he's talking about the life that God has brought him, the God of my life. But then look at what happens. He again drops back into this whole problem of the soulish part that relates to the hum humanity of us rather than the spiritual part. I say to my God, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go around mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Have you ever been in a place where you wondered if God forgot you? You've been asking him for something and it doesn't happen. And you begin to ask yourself, well, maybe he's forgotten all about me. But it gets so deep for this psalmist. He says, my bones suffer mortal agony. In other words, it's not just on the exterior that he's, that he's dealing with this, but that it gets down deep within him. My bones suffer mortal, and my foes taunt me, saying all to me all day long, where is your God? You always find those negatives, um, even some of them in church, where you've been trusting God for something that just hasn't come through. And you, the question, where is God in all of this? Where is God? And that's continually the thing that comes to the psalmist. Where is God in all of this? Uh, you know, you brag about God, you talk about how good he is, but where is he in all of this? Um, and he goes on to say, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Again, he comes back to the real issue. He knows the answer. Okay? The answer is to put his hope in God. For I will yet praise him. In other words, there's, there's going to be a future yet. That uh, time coming. My Savior and my God. But then you go into 43. Yep, which is really a part of 42. And he says, vindicate me. Prove my innocence, Lord. Justify me. Prove me. Plead my cause against an ungodly nation. In other words, fight for me. Rescue me from deceitful and wicked men. Rescue me. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you, what? Rejected me. Notice how far in the humanity he gets, he goes. First of all, he talks about um, how, why have you forgotten me? But now it reaches a point of further depression. When he begins to say, why have you rejected me? Abandoned, denied, forsaken. Why, Lord? He's still struggling with his humanity. Do you ever find yourself struggling with humanity, even though you have the Spirit of God with you? Um, do you ever reach a point where you don't struggle with humanity? I don't think you do. I don't think, no matter how godly you are or whatever, you never reach a point where you don't have this struggle at times between your soul and your spirit and your humanity is, is really uh, putting the pressure on you. But he says, why have you rejected me or abandoned or denied me, forsaken? Why must I go around about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send forth your light and truth. Let them guide me. Now, notice that it's the light and the truth that are going to guide him, and it's the light and the truth that are going to guide us. 
What is the light? Okay. What does the word say? A lamp is a light unto my feet, my pathway. And the light that is being talked about and truth that is being talked about is the word of God. Truth is expressed in the word of God. Now, here we are. What is Jesus become? He's the light of the world. Okay. What else happens? We told in, we're told in John chapter chapter one that the light the word became what? Flesh. Flesh, yes. So Jesus is that word. He spoke it in the beginning, but he became flesh. Okay? So it's following his word and following him that will guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain. Let them be the ones that bring me to the place where you dwell. Now, uh, he's talking about a place. He's talking about the tabernacle. But for you and I, what does the word and the light do for us? Gives you hope. Gives you hope. Hmm? Does it bring you into the presence of the Lord? Yes. Of course it does. That's what brings you into the presence of the Lord. You read his word. You accept the reality of Jesus as the light of the world. And it is the word that became flesh. And let them bring me to your holy mountain, he says. To the place where you dwell. Then will I go to the altar of God, my God, my joy, and my delight. Do you have an altar? Do you have a place somewhere where you go to God and can uh, really cry out to God? Where is your altar? I'm not asking you to respond, but where is your altar? Think this through. Where is your altar? Where is that place in your life where you can really get alone with God? Um, not just with other people, but alone with God. There must be a place where we can come and even kneel in His presence, whether that's in you bedroom or whether it's in your living room or wherever it is, a place that becomes sacred to you, where you meet with God in a special way, personally. And he says, then will I go to the altar of God, my God, my joy, and my delight. Is there any other greater joy in your relationship with the Lord? Is there any other greater delight than your relationship with the Lord? When you go to that altar at a time when you're alone with God and he speaks in your heart and you know that he's speaking to you in some way or another. Those are the delightful times that we spend with God. Now, he goes on to say, I will praise you with the harp, O oh God, my God. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Have you heard that before? Yeah. Twice before. Right. But it was words. <clears throat> For him it was worse, it was truth for him, but it still eluded him from the standpoint of being a part of his hope in God in the future. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. You come to the end, and he comes to the end, and he realizes that what he has said 
in past times is truth. He knows it to be truth, but now he really sinks in and becomes a part of him. This then means that his faith has reached the point that no matter where he is, what he's doing, what's happening to him, my hope is still in God. I will yet praise him, the save my Savior and my God. He realizes that even though he's away from God now, that there will come a time when he's again back where he wants to be with the God he loves and delights in. I'm just wondering how delightful God is to us. How delightful. Do we delight in him? Do we find in him hope? And the hope that he's expressing now is for the future. I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Do you have hope for the future? You, you bet you, you do if you're a believer. And he is hoping in God. And I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. What do you think about these two psalms? Tell me what your, what your thought is. That they're almost one. Yeah, they are. Yeah. yeah. They are. That's why, they, that's why in many Hebrew manuscripts they are one. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. When you have hunger and thirst for the Lord, then He is the one who satisfies us. Let's say that again. When we hunger, yeah, hunger. and thirst for the Lord, yes. the Lord satisfies us. Yes. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a while for us to get the answer deep within our spirit. You know, it doesn't always come. We know the words, you know, and the psalmist knew the words, hoping God. But he wasn't doing that. He was saying it out of, you know, his past experiences, but he wasn't doing that, actually. At the end of this, now, it's an actual reality. Now I'm going to hope in God. And now I'm, my future is secure, and now my faith is established, and it's not going to change, no matter what. Somebody else, talk to me about these psalms. What do you think? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like I say, I can't be the only one that talks. I'm really biting my tongue here. But there's more than just me. Well, no, tell us. You know, um, it, to me, it seems like it comes at a time when, like you said, he was greatly depressed. He's questioning his faith almost. Um, questioning if God's still there with him. Uh, I know because I felt that. You know that when you know first become a believer, man, you're on fire and you're chasing God and you're believing every little thing and every little good thing that happens, you're you're totally, oh, that's from God, that's from God. And the longer you go, and then you see that even a no from God has goodness written all over it, you know, and you realize that all your blessings are not what you think they are, that blessings that God pours out upon you or sometimes for your benefit, but you don't like it. So yeah, and it, I think that it comes from a time where he's really questioning his faith. Sure. You know, where he's questioning if if what he knows of God now in his depressed state, I guess you could say, is what he truly believes or wants yeah. until the end when he finds out that no matter what, like I said, even a no has goodness written all over it. The reason I, I picked this psalm is I just believe that there's so much of it that we at times in our life struggle with. We struggle with our humanity. We struggle with other things. And we know the answers because we've been taught. But knowing the answer and applying it in our lives are two different things. Amen. Um, sure, you can say hope in God, and uh, how many times you hear that, but does it really sink in? Okay, I'm going to hope in God. I'm going to really do this, you know. Um, 
so many times we just find ourselves uh, reciting words, or even, as I said in the beginning, uh, Christianity becoming more of a ritual right. than it is a relationship. And this is the thing the psalmist is, is vying for. He wants his, his life with God to not be ritual, but to be relational. I remember you, God, after all of the remembrance he had of the past, it wasn't enough. I remember you, Lord. And that's when things began to change for him because that's when his love, he saw, recognized God's love that was always with him. And at nighttime, there was a song that he would pray um, to the Lord. Um, do, you have, do you have a chorus or a song that brings you close to God? It is well with my soul. Yeah. Well with my soul. It is well with my soul. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Anybody else? In the garden. I'm sorry? In the garden. In the garden. Okay. What a day that will be. I'm sorry? What a day that will be. What a day that will be. We might say, your eyes shall see. Yeah. Yeah. Christ, I'm Christ on the solid rock I stand. I'm sorry? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All, uh -huh. the, sand, yeah. all the ground is sinking sand. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it too. But it's so good that even when you recline at night, you can just simply, and you don't have to be able to carry it to me. Okay. We talked about that last week. Okay. God's not interested in you. Your tunes, right? He's interested in your heart, right? And how good it is at nighttime. So many times when you're getting ready to fall asleep, unless you're one of those, as soon as your head hits the pillow, you're out. That's not me. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking all the time. You know, I'm trying. But it's so good to know that I can start to. In, it doesn't have to be loud because I don't want. To, disturbed my wife, but that I can begin to sing a song that's a prayer, and I know it's reaching out to God, because He is my delight, and and uh, I'm thankful to God for that. Amen. Yes? What I really love about the songs, Dr. Mother, is the, um, the honesty. Yes. The honesty of this writer to express that I'm downcast. Yes. I, I have hope. I have to remind myself that I have hope, but I'm downcast. Yes. Because that's the reality of the human condition. Yes. Humanity around us creates that, that challenge and that difficulty, and we find that we have to counsel our heart with the truth of God's Word. And I'm wondering if you could maybe share you know, how you do that. When, when you find yourself in those moments where you're downcast, what do you do? How do you put your hope? How do you remind yourself to put your hope in the Lord? A lot of times it's through a song. Uh, I just happen to enjoy singing. And so a lot of times it'll be a chorus or, um, as Jim mentioned, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Um, that to me is a very pivotal s song, and uh, and there's just times that I find myself talking t to myself, and I know it's my spirit talking to the humanity of me, and uh, and saying, "Let's get this thing under control." Um, where is your real delight? You know. So, it, but. As far as the honesty, we said it right from the beginning. One of the most amazing things about the, all of the Psalms is how honest these guys, these people were before God. They pour out themselves, their hearts, and whether they were right or wrong, they were honest before God to where they are in that particular situation. And that's a key. That's a key uh, that you're bringing up, the honesty. Because God knows your heart anyway. I mean, it's not like something you can hide from him. 
Um, he knows what you're thinking before you think it. Yeah. He knows what you're going to say before you say it, according to God's word. I mean, he knows you. So why do we try to trick him, I guess, or, and uh, not be honest with him? It's absolutely essential to be honest with yourself and with God. If things are going badly, you're honest about it. That's, that's, if you're struggling with your, with your spiritual life, be honest about it. Just to say, God, I'm struggling with this, you know, and uh, he has a way of intervening. Anybody else? Yes. I just had something to say, Dr. Meyer. Like, um, I've noticed um, maybe um, over the years trying to be honest with God as far as... Um, you know, it's just been a process for me learning that. Uh, Talk about that, we can't hear you. Okay. Um, I've noticed over the years in like going to church and stuff that I can't be honest with everybody as far as where I'm at. And uh, even with God, sometimes uh, it's it's been like a performance situation where I've had to learn to be honest with him where I could be honest with him because of. Uh, whatever yeah but uh i think um over the years i had to like uh just get over being not having to be good all the time and being honest like hey this is where i'm at and uh you know i can't fix myself and um i can't talk to anybody about it because you know i don't want to feel any shame especially in the church because yeah. you know with the whole performance thing, it's like, what do you mean you're not you're not spirit filled and you know great all the time and you're not joyful? It's like, well, I'm not yeah. But um, I've noticed God has been someone that I could do that first with, even when there wasn't people out there that were even willing to understand. More so, just hey, I can't relate with you. Yeah. I don't understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, that's great. You've come to a point, and, and we tend to not be honest with one another anyway. How are you feeling? Fine. <laughs> right. Huh? Right. When in, the truth is, you're 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 struggling. We're not honest about it half the time, you know, and we kind of carry that as into our our life cycle here and even try to say to God we're fine but the truth is and thank you for bringing that out Mike that we the first place we need to be honest is with God and if we can't be honest with our brothers and sisters in Christ there's something wrong we need to be honest with one another um, we tend to want to be present ourselves as the perfect, you know, God's put his touch upon us, boy, everything's everything's golden, everything's good. But it doesn't work that way all the time. There's times we struggle. And so the only way we're going to get out of the struggle is be honest with God and even be honest with people that we know that will help us and pray with us and not ex and not accept us just because we want to be perfect. We accept us because we all have flaws. And uh, if any one of us can have that flaw at any time. And so we need each other for, for support for that. That's what the church is all about. That's why the church is here, to support one another. Because we're all sinners saved by grace Amen. all of us Amen. Uh, it's God's grace that Amen. brings to us our salvation but the truth is we're all in the sinners class I mean we, no matter how good we try to be you can't be perfect right so, but God overlooks all of that he just wants us to be honest about it with him and uh, he helps us 
in those situations to uh, to to uh, come out victoriously if we're honest with him. You won't come out victoriously if you're not honest. <laughs> if you're trying in any way to to uh, put it under the carpet, you won't get victory over it. You have to be honest. And that's what this psalmist, and really all of the psalms, this psalms are, they're all songs, okay? They're, again, we told you they, this was the, the hymnal of the tabernacle, okay? They're psalms. And they're all honest before God when they and that is so enlightening for us. It should be. And here is God's word, and it's teaching that even God's people struggle. Be honest with it. Be honest with God. Be honest with one another. Anybody else want to say anything? If not, yes, yes, Jim. In both the Psalms, three times we saw to put our hope in God. Yes. You know, when, when our soul is downcast. And it's, I think it's, we have to remind ourselves all the time that He is the Savior. Yes. And He is the one who can only save us. Yes. When we fall down. But sometimes we try to solve our problems ourselves. Or sometimes we depend on people. But the first thing we have to do is just to put our hope on God and ask Him to save us from that, whatever situation. Yeah. Were you raised in a Christian home? Yes, I was. Yes, was. No. Sure. Um, no. Or you're lucky you're married. <laughs> yeah. He's such a straight. <laughs> in India? Yes. Yeah. And where did, how did you come to find the Lord? Uh, I, I can say that it's through Ben only I came to know the Lord. And uh, from my childhood, I always had a desire to make a friendship with Christian uh, people. I used to love uh, to see church and choir and uh, all those things. I always had a desire to meet Christians from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But then when I met Ben, uh, he told me about Christ and he told me like how to pray and how to read the Bible. And that's how I came to the Lord. You're blessed. Thank God. That's great. Great to have you. Any other comments? I just want to add something here that I experienced with you, Bruce, that I had said something and you had to repeat. I said, I didn't hear what you said. And then you had to repeat. I said, I still can't hear what you said because I'm hard of hearing. Finally, he raised his voice. I mean, the, the, the ceiling shook. <laughs> okay. And I said, stop it. You sound just like my mother. <laughs> I no sooner got upstairs and the Lord says, you owe your husband an apology. And I did. I knew I did that. So I came down and I said, Bruce, please forgive me. I should never have said that. And he looked at me and he said, honey, I still have a lot to learn. <laughs> and that's the relationship that we have, honesty. And I'm so pleased that he realizes he's still learning. We've never been through this day before in our life. Right. Tomorrow, if, we, if the Lord doesn't come, we have another day to face. We don't know what we're going to face. And I appreciate your honesty also in saying, I have a lot, I still have a lot to learn, Marion. And we're married 60 years, and we're still learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because every, every decade, we change, we age. We, but God knows how to if you're willing to be, obey what the Lord says, he's willing to just smooth it all over. Yes. It, so I'd also like to... I'm sorry? I'd also like to express that it's, it's healthy. It's healthy to ask these questions. And it's healthy to foster an environment where it's safe to ask these questions so that we can address and, and encourage people in the midst of 
their downcast spirit sure. to put their hope in the Lord, to sure. praise the Lord. Yes. Like when Mike was talking, I mean, how sad to be in a place if you think you can't be honest about what, what's happening. And so sometimes we think that if we question, that's uh, uh, a lack of integrity in our faith, and that's not true. It's good to ask these questions and to be honest about them because what it does is it allows us to then reevaluate and realize that no matter what we're going through, the promises that we have in the Lord are far greater. Yes. And so we can indeed put our hope in Him. Absolutely. You know, we've made it through 60 years of marriage, but it's the 61st. It's, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta make sure we make it through that one too. <laughs> yes. Uh, I wanted to comment on this. Why are you downcast, oh my soul? And how that this is something I myself struggle with. You know, just getting into like a down feeling. You know, even though I'm saved <coughs> and I know the Lord. And the only way I pull out of that is to begin, you know, I think you had mentioned that self-talk. What you say to yourself when you feel low or you start feeling bad or, or whatever, depressed, then I begin to remind myself of how good God is. Yes. I remind him, I mean, you know, I remind myself that at least I'm able to get up and get out and... You know, just all the good things that God is doing in my life. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of begins to pull you up, thinking yeah. about God's promises. Yeah. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Yeah. And yeah. just begin just that self-talk. Yeah. You know, that good self-talk. Because you, I find myself getting, uh, you know, why are you cast down all oh, my soul? I mean, that comes pretty often sometimes, yeah. you know. And... Pulling out of it by going to God's word, re reciting God's word, repeating God's word, thinking about the goodness that God has brought into my life, and it just pulls you up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Pulls you up out of it. And to remember God, not just the experiences of the past, but to remember Him, that His love never ceases. Mm -hmm. you, as a starting point that you can have, that you could count on when you're going through a depressed time. Remember that God loves you in that depression, <clears throat> no matter what you're going through. Yeah, Dr. Meyer. Dr. Meyer, I was just going to say, I didn't know what I should say this, but you know, like when you do something you feel guilty about, or you, you know, you don't think you did the right thing, and then you ask the Lord to forgive you. Yes. And then I find myself lately just trying to explain to the Lord you know, my side of the story, you know. I just wonder if other people do that, you know, just try to explain it. You know, why did I do that? You know, it wasn't right, why did I do that? And just discuss it with them, you know. I just, I don't know. Conversation. Yeah, I guess. Relationship. There isn't anything we go through that somebody else isn't going through too. That's why our hope has to be in God. Yeah, not just words, but a reality. Thanks. Go ahead. I also like how these psalms start off, um, because it kind of sets the stage for the psalm. And when it says that, as a deer pants for the water, so yeah. my soul pants for you. Yeah. Um, it's basically saying that, it's showing you right there that he's, he's not with God. And what transpires after is because he's not with God. And he's and the struggles that he's having is his soul against his spirit saying his spirit saying you need to be with God, trust in God, have your faith in God. Mm -hmm. And his soul's like, No, I got this going on and I got that going yeah, on. Yeah. This is on me and yeah. this is on me. Yeah. So I love how it starts off because right away it's it's showing you that he's not exactly with God and he longs to be with God and trickles down to what is going on and the struggles in his life and what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, I also like these songs because it it just shows us that we're not alone. Everybody struggles. That's yeah. right. um, and it gives us encouragement to um, 
in those time of struggles, when we are struggling with ourselves, to make sure that we find the time and we we keep our faith and our hope in God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you, and I just want you to, to uh, make sure that you greet two wonderful friends of ours that are here tonight, uh, Debbie and Chucky. Mm -hmm. This is their first experience here. In the <laughs> Chucky de defines himself as one of the newborns. Right. <laughs> That's not scary at all. That's great. John, lead us in prayer, will you please? Father, you are gracious. You are loving, Lord God. Thank you for the word that was spoken tonight. Yes. Lord, let us not just be hearers, but let us be doers. Let our, our soul pant after you, Father God. Mm -hmm. And not just in a small way, Father God, but like a deer that just ran three miles and found a, a watering hole and he's sucking up that water. That's how we yes. need to suck up you, Father God. Thank you for the words preached by Dr. Mother. Uh, give everyone a safe passage in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Amen.